So it, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Epi Pengale from the Kingdom of Atlantia, and they are teaching class number 246, which is a virtual visit of the Museo Nacional de Arte de Catalunya. Go ahead. All righty. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me. Um, we are in Barcelona, and about me, I have a background in history and art history. I uh, also exhibition design. I work in museums in Washington, D.C., and I'm an armager, which is an AOA level of award. People ask me a lot, like, what's an armager? Um, with being shut down, um, my coworker and I, so I'm a museum lighting designer, and then my coworker, who's also a museum lighting designer, and I, we're kind of at a loss of what to do with being sent home. Um, so for since last April until a week ago, we were basically giving a virtual museum tour a week. I have that's like 50 plus upper 50, lower 60. I can't do math. Virtual museum tours, and I realized that that they could be skatingified to be fun and exciting for all of you. Um, if you like this, I do have a couple more coming up. And so we'll talk a bit about the museum. Uh, we'll do a walkthrough with Google Arts and Culture. We'll I talk about the exhi exhibition design. Um, and we'll look at a couple of the highlight objects. And again, ask questions at any point. That sounds as Oh, look at this museum. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so. So this is from the upper level, taking a look, but um, it is right in the heart of the city. Uh, the building was originally built for the World's Fair, or the um, International Exhibition, and in the 1920s, and was repurposed in, 19, in the 1930s to become a museum. Now, it, it opened in 1934 as uh, Museo de Arte Colonia, and which kind of brought together the medieval collection. Um, they even moved the, all the art out for the Civil War, and then they brought it all back in. Um, and it's kind of expanded and glommed other collections over the years. What was happening in the 1920s to kind of cause this to happen to a certain extent is that a lot of the local churches, a lot of the um, smaller places were having their art kind of sold off or they were selling off their murals um and the people kind of said like no we shouldn't do that like we should you know house it and don't let these treasures leave spain for which you know i'm definitely grateful because it is i've never been here i want to go and it's like all of the cool murals in one place um as i mentioned originally was um the site of the World's Fair. And the mission of the museum is, as a public organization, it boosts the social and educational use so as to become a space of knowledge, debate, and social tie, and one of participation, placing knowledge, the collection, and the resources at the service of the public. The museum aims to show the Catalan artistic expression without chronological limits and at the same time generate new knowledge, the result of the research and work with other institutions. They also have cool party lights. I like cool party lights. I think they're fun. So this, so unfortunately, <laughs> this photo comes from Stasi um, because I couldn't find it when I was doing my walkthrough because it's really hard to get into the um, into the Romanesque section. And so I don't know if they've taken this down and it was just not captured when they did the um, Sorry, the who's what's it? The the Google Arts and Culture capture, or if it was, um, I just couldn't find it because oh, popping through it gets a little difficult. Um, also, pardon me because I'm definitely trying to find one of my pages that is must have gotten mixed in with my notes from the Moscow Beetle class, or maybe I just didn't print it. Hmm. That would be very unfortunate, very fast. Um, I'm going to apologize really quickly and go run to my printer to see if I just didn't grab all my pages. I'm embarrassed. Sorry. 
Sorry about that. Um, I left it on the printer. <laughs> I was in a rush grabbing all my notes before Magister Beatrice's class. Um, anyway, <laughs> so this is actually um, the Master of the Conquest of Malor um, Mallorca, which came from the uh, old mansion house of the Collins family in, um, and it's currently now the uh, Museo, that, that building that it was in is now uh, the Museo de Caso. Um, it was originally moved to this taken apart and moved to this museum in 1961. And um, it's basically considered one of the most relevant examples of Catalan art from the first Gothic and lineal Gothic phases. Um, it narrates the conquest of the island of Mallorca um, by James I. The Conqueror, which happened in uh, 1229, and it's painted chronologically, so it's, you know, from the beginning, it's uh, going through um, all its travels, and, you know, I always love ponies, so you see a nice little picture of Barney right there. Um, but. The museum itself is laid out in a chronological fact fashion, but I just, so that way I wasn't popping in and out of PowerPoint to show you this really cool piece of art. I wanted to show it to you first. And that is all of my slides. So really quickly, this is, if it'll load, my, as you can see, my laptop is very upsetting for all of the different uh, tabs I have open. This is their museum website. And is the, the cool new thing in museums to have a sideways passing instead of up and down web page. <laughs> um, they do have their exhibitions online of like the previous ones as well as their future ones. Um, I preloaded everything to try to make it a little bit easier. Um, if you go and you want to like see you know what's going on at the museum or like what tour i should go on um you know it has a little online they call it, they give it as like an a uh, virtual tour um where it basically takes you like artwork and artwork like you know piece by piece uh thematically through the section um but it's not a virtual tour like we might think of a virtual tour because it's just still images and text um, this is one of their other, and then they have this, this they also call a virtual tour, which is very different, um, which I just wanted to show you quickly so you get a comprehensive view of the museum. Um, there, I will show you some other stuff at the end that's also just for the sake of a comprehensive view of the understanding of the museum, where they have, um, you know, videos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where they have things linked and it's just kind of a scroll down, which again, not really a virtual tour. Um, I also think that's really important that Skadians understand museum collection websites. Um, they have a very good um, collection website. It's, uh, you know, you can find quick things, you can search in the catalog, uh, you can learn about when they the interventions in the rooms. Basically, they renovated everything in the aughts, and when they stopped, they started over again. <laughs> so they're like, we're doing this big renovation. Yay, we finished. Let's do it again, um, which I find amusing. This is their interactive map that they have on the website. Um, it, you know, you could hover over it, and it shows you, like, where the Wi-Fi spots are. You can also say, oh, well, I need to figure out where, like, the changing rooms are. It'll show you that, um, which is very handy if you're on, if you're, like, pre-planning your visit, um, especially for accessibility. But they also have this um, static one as well, which I'm assuming 
they have translated to a PDF um, brochure at the actual museum, which, you know, had some information about, oh, it's so, it's, okay, um, exhibitions, information about the exhibitions. Unfortunately, you have to go all the way through that before it'll take you to the other floor. Um, it is only two floors, which is very convenient. Um, this is the main Google Arts and Culture page. Um, so if you went into Google Arts and Culture and you said, hey, I want to look at this museum, this is what it would take you to. It has um, a little bit of background on the museum. It tells you some of the stuff that's there. Uh, you can sort your exhibition or your highlighted objects through like things that are popular, you know, when they were made, what it's made out of or in colors. Um, and then it has three different access portals, which um, if you clicked on them, it would bring you into Google Arts and Culture. They're not all connected to one another. Um, sometimes they are depending on the interface and, what they were, and when the images were captured and if they integrated them. Um, this museum did not. So if you went into one of them, it would not connect you to the others, just so you're aware. Um, and we're actually going, this is just, again, outside. You're walking up, this is what you would see. And this is in the entryway. So you come in the museum. You know, they take capturing this at night. They have horrible light exposure. Um, <laughs> You'll notice that with Google Arts and Culture is sometimes they have great light exposure, sometimes they have terrible light exposure, but they do have a plethora of signage, which, you know, is very good if you don't want, if you want to find where you're going and not get lost. Um, to me, I find it a little bit overwhelming just because there's so many things to look at. But the Gothic art is off to the right. And then we have Romanesque art off to the left, as well as, you know, our accessibility ramp. Um, you know, something that I liked about what they did is they have the, um, for going for the banners, they have it kind of sightlined with the image on the front of the staircase. So that way it all looks the same if you're looking at it straight on, which you can kind of see here with the modern art, which we're straighter onto in this view. And going back here, um, cause as you remember, it is a, uh, it was originally built for a, um, World's Fair. It's, it's very elaborate. Uh, lots of interesting architecture that we'll take a look at. Um, if I'm moving too quickly, tell me because I know that people moving too quickly on this can make you uh, seasick or motion sickness. Um, just a little museum shop. And then it'll let me into the performance area, which I'm sure it's a blast to go to concerts here. Um, so this is going back to the Romanesque area. The entire museum, um, I believe I mentioned what is laid out chronologically. So we are right here in, you know, Salo one. Um, this is one of their older captures. Um, it has the, informa uh, the information, which you can't see easily, um, in Spanish, English, and Catalan. Um, and just interesting doorways all around. You can see that they have very basic braces on this, um, on this artwork. And they're just going to go through. And this is... Um, a lot of these, this area was basically really built to be uh, the recreation of a church that they got everything from uh, in Bui. And this is the stoning of St. Stephen, which was one of their oldest pieces that was actually one of the ones that they did, like, with like their first piece to like ever truly do conservation work on, and they're very proud of it. Um, but it's a stoning of St. Stephen, who is um, you know, outside of a church and, um, 
he's getting stoned because they're like, oh, you believe in Christ, and but look, God will save him with the magical pew pew fingers. That's the technical term. Um, but they just really built it out uh, to echo what the original church looked like. They have seats so you can really get everything in. Um, because of how light the walls are, like like colored the walls are in this space, um, in this iteration uh, before they renovated, uh, they only really lit the artwork that's on the walls and let the light bounce off the really shiny floors to light this other area. Like they have a little bit of down lighting for safety, but it's nothing extraordinary. All right. Um, this is the apse of Anueth, um, which was built in uh, 1090, or between 1090 and 1120. And uh, it's, uh, it's from the church of the Santa Maria de Anueth. I'm sorry, I'm very bad at pronouncing things. Um, and I will merge all my European accents horribly together um, from the Pyrenees Mountains. Um, and it's showing a lot of uh, Lombardian influences. And they say that it's uh, part of the stylistic circle of the master of Pedret, uh, who we'll talk about more of it later. Um, and it has themes from both the Old Testament and the New Testament regarding um, the, the uh, hope of the coming of Messiah and like, you know, how humanity is going to be redeemed, which is what the prophets had said. And the top part of the lower part are a little bit disconnected from one another um, in regards to like, you know, they have the seraphim there and they're singing a song of praise to the Lord. Um, and you can see the SCS, it's like Sanctus, 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 that's a holy, holy, holy. Um, and you have um, the four wheels of the fiery chariot of Yahweh, uh, which is an allusion to the vision of Ezekiel. And there's also the archangels above, which you can't see fairly well, but a little bit of one, that's the most visible there. Um, and they're advocates of the day of judgment. Um, they say that the, uh, they being the academics that know more about this than I do, um, they, had, they say that the subject matter has its origins in more Italian representation for this time period and iconography, uh, but it has Byzantine influences. And a lot of the Byzantine influences that they're looking at is that, you know, the prophets um, down at the bottom, they have um, kind of unshaven beard right there and that their uh, clothing is a bit and their faces and you can kind of see under the jaw there are a bit more you can see more of the wrinkles um, which is a bit more Byzantine in the style of the clothing is a bit more Byzantine than you might traditionally see in the area for the time period um, um. Oh, and someone commented on the perspective in the the arches in that one. Can you zoom in a little bit on those so we can see them closer maybe? I will do what I can. Um, some of you have heard me speak um, about how sometimes you accidentally go through walls with Google Arts and Culture. Um, if you go onto the uh, collection website as well, um, they also have higher resolution images, uh, just as a reference point. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, and one of the other things I want to show you is kind of how they're doing this. And by how they're doing this, I mean, this is what the shell looks like for all the different um, murals that they put in, right? Because you need to support it somehow. And I thought it was really fascinating that they just left it exposed. Like, I assume it's fire treated wood. Um, so that way you're not about to accidentally burn things up. But they just left it exposed. They didn't try to hide it at all. They didn't 
put it behind a wall. They just said, yep, it's wood. <laughs> That's what it's going to look like. <laughs> Sorry, did not mean to hit that button. Uh, and they just, yeah, just built them out along the way. Now, this is, um, they had to build a higher section and use a higher section here. Uh, you can see how they have like these little half walls coming from the ceiling with this, the lights coming down, um, which by lowering the lights, they, it makes it a bit safer for this back, back hallway, um, which leads to, you know, the, the stairway and the accessibility ramp. Um, and this allows to put some of the taller objects in there, um, which is the apps of San Clemente de Tray. Um, and I'll, I'll get closer, but I also want to show you real fast, like, look, nice benches to take a look at stuff, as well as some lower lighting as well near the, the ground. So that way you don't, because you don't want people to trip. You'd, um, you'll notice again here that all these have a border on the bottom, like so people can't get right up underneath them. But there are museum standards for, hey, we expect it to be this big so that we are not, like people that have, um, you know, walkers or canes will bop it. Um, so you'll see here that uh, Jesus has a nice halo over his head. He has, he has the world at his feet. Um, his hand, the book that is holding says, Ego sum lux mundi, which translates in English to like, I am the light of the world, um, as well as the alpha and omega, um, which again, the beginning and end. And you also see uh, the various, on this level, you'll see um, St. Thomas, St. Bartholomew, uh, the Virgin Mary hanging out, uh, St. John the Evangelist, uh, St. James and San Felipe. Um, and it just has a lot of uh, bright colors. Uh, according to the museum collection website, which who am I to argue with them? Uh, they said that it fascinated 20th century avant-garde artists like Picasso and Francis Picabia. So that is your fun fact of the day, is that this specific apps fascinated them. Um, but it combines the different uh, um, elements, for, or it combines elements from different biblical visions. Again, uh, they have uh, visions from Revelations, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, um, where you see Christ on the Day of Judgment. Um, and it's just a big set, like, it's very ornamented, it's a big sense of volume. You know, we have a lot of detail with the, everything on here. And I am going a little bit front heavy with the highlight objects because they're the things that I find more interesting. Uh, towards the end, we're going to just look a little bit more at these. Um, unfortunately, when you all are stuck in the tour with me, you get to look at what I like to look at. It's very unfortunate for you. Uh, this is on the opposite wall of that. So the same back hallway that we saw is just continuing on along here. They put in these little tiny railways, which we kind of saw in other spots. Um, help keep people from the wall. I'm sure that there's still going to be a guard down here saying, don't touch that. Because so there was a question asking what yeah. medium these are in. They're murals. So I would say that they're paint of some kind. I don't know what's in the composition of the paint. Um, I'm sure it's on the collection website, but I myself am not certain. Okay. And there are questions about, it would have been fascinating to see these moved. Is there any, uh, do you have any information on the process or do they have videos of that on their website? So unfortunately, most of these were moved um, well, originally during the 30s or 20s and then during the late 20s, early 30s through the 30s, actually going all the way again into the 60s and beyond um, because after the Civil War, they, everything got moved out and everything got moved back in. Um, we will take a look. I did, I did pull up, um, if you notice that my tab has a little black tab at the end, which is from one of the uh, collection web pages, where it does have some of the images that I believe are from 
either when they're conserving it or when they moved it, but I, I can't quite remember which at the moment. Um, some, so on the collection website, uh, they do have some images on some pieces of that are archival of them being moved. Um, but, and then if you go to the St. Stephen's, um, I, I, we looked earlier at the Sony of St. Stephen, they have a actually a 14 page PDF on the collection website uh, linked about what restoration for that looked like, um, you know, how they backed it in animal glue and fabric originally and how they had to kind of undo that and do things that were more sustainable um, and healthy for the artwork. Because that's like one of the fun things about working in a museum is like what we thought conserves things in the, you know, in the 20th century, I found out <laughs> not so great now. Um, with the long term ramifications of using that. Uh, so I hope that is useful information for whoever was asking. <laughs> um, again, it's like, you, yeah, like you'll find so much on the collection website, I swear. <laughs> uh, and we're still in the, the first Romanette section. Uh, it just also happens to be what I find uh, most interesting. Um, here, they just have, you know, we have Christ and Judgment again, along with the symbols of evangelists. In the corners, um, I like how they use the uplights to, again, just literally uplight what's going on in this section, um, as well as you know building in these lights into the floor to do the same thing, because they couldn't put any ceiling lights in because the artwork's in the ceiling, um, and so it's, it's always interesting to me to see like how people problem solve. Uh, bouncing light is always a good friend for architectural elements of museums. And they do the same thing here. Um, you can see how they literally built around the walls around the columns that were there from when the building was originally made. And they just built the walls right up next to it. And you see the little uplights to show off the archways that they can. They have a little bit of track lighting installed. Um, I'm very impressed, actually, with their electrical system. Uh, one of the buildings I work in was built in the 1920s, and it's a, the struggle is real to get electric places. Uh, it's not overload the system, even though it's been fixed. It, it's always a struggle. Um, and they also added in some of these um, smaller liturgical objects. Um, I feel like that's a reliquary, just guessing based off the size. I actually don't know anything about it. But I'm assuming that the bird is a reliquary. Um, which is a small ornamental box or thing, um, bird, uh, that people would put pieces of relic the saints in. Uh, I know at one time they did the math and it's like, if you put all the pieces of Jesus together, he had like 10 hands, but like people say have, they have relic players now, they're like, oh yeah, there's 10 hands and this and that and the other. So we moved across the main entrance again to, or we moved across the main entrance to get to, into the Gothic section here. Um, Again, this is one of their slightly older captures, so color quality, still not so great. Uh, and everything in the Romanesque and Gothic uh, areas, as well as upstairs in the modern um, art, it's all done in chronological order. So it goes from you know oldest Romanesque through youngest Romanesque, and then uh, same thing with the Gothic. And they just kind of just doing big wall washes, you know, there's a little bit of aerial, like, I don't want to call it spotlight, there's not true spotlight on the artworks, but they're kind of just letting it ambiently light everything. Um, if you look up, I look up at museums a lot, it's a problem. Um, you can see how they have like these little cove lightings that they're bouncing light up to get it, that yeah, it's weird. But they're using the architecture as best they can. Um, I'm going through the hall. Okay, and there were some comments um, about gloves used to be the rule with handling old text, and I know even other old things that I've handled myself. And people were wondering why that changed. So now that manuscripts are handled with bare hands rather than with gloves, people will be careful, more careful with their bare hands, is a factor. Um, something about wearing gloves makes people. Like whether it's the textile aspect of it, of uh, um, touching it and being able to feel it a bit better, to, uh, or something else, uh, 
a lot of times people will just be more careful with their bare hands. And then also sometimes a little bit of oil is good for your um, for your uh, artifact, depending on what it is. Uh, a lot of pottery and stuff, you'll see that too. Um, Oh, so oh, sorry. They also have here um, some built-in cases that they added in with a little bit of internal lighting, which wiring that again very impressed for a 1920s building because we played the electricity game a lot and we normally lose. We normally tell people like designers like no, we can't do that. There's there's a lot electric. We will blow a circuit. It'll be bad. Um, and you'll see here that they continue the little dinky railing. And they just like built these big metal braces just to <laughs> keep it off the wall, keep it sturdy off the wall. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna zoom in a little, ah, a little bit where you can see where they printed on the wall like what room you're in. So visitorship, if you get lost, it'll be right there. Um, and that's a lot of lovely artwork that's kind of being. We, we a lot of times call this white walls versus just white walls, just hanging out. Um, it was really popular in the 20th century. And, and the question is, some of those are LED lights, possibly. So I will I will save that question to the end. Okay. Um, because I, I have a long ramble about LED lights in museums, um, which is probably that I, I, I can go on for a hot minute. Um, anyway, so remember when I said at the beginning, when I went at the first Google Arts and Culture page, that um, the there's like three different uh, mechanisms for hopping into the, into the Google Arts and Culture. Um, one of them is from this year. It's from 2020. If you look right here, it says 2021. Sorry, it is 2021. 2021. Google. Um, so this is their redesign. As I mentioned, they are basically they renovated everything and said, let's do it again. Um, and you can see that they actually put color in. It's exciting. And this is also a significantly better exposure of the photos. Um, again, we can see all the different museum representation or language representation, um, which Kudos to them because I think all museums should have more than one language, and a lot of ones in the United States don't. Uh, they also change their uh, benches so they stand out a bit more. They have different colored pedestals for the artwork. They have these cool little infographic stands now that blend in nicely, um, so they don't have all the labels on the wall. Uh, I go back to the, I will find, if there's a pony in the museum, I will find the pony. Another example of a pony in the museum um, with really interesting barding. Uh, I'm currently trying to figure out how to make something like this and whether, how much of it is leather and how much of it is fabric, but that is a side story um, for a different day. So this guy right here is, um, is there a question? Um, <laughs> no, I am going to mute you, Beade. So I think we were just getting some feedback, is all. Okay. Um, so this is um, St. Candidus. Uh, and this was painted in um, 1502, 1570 um, by, when he's dressed uh, by, uh, sorry, on uh, Anya Brith which is, I know I just destroyed that pronunciation. I'm so sorry. Um, but, you know, he dressed as a knight. He, um, it could have been on one of the panels of the high altar piece from the Monastery of San Gade um, Valle. Um, the museum has another one. Uh, but they're basically the only two pieces by this artist um, who's considered one of the most important names in Catalan, um, art of the 15th century. Um, he had Central European origin and training, um, a lot of familiarity with Flemish culture, uh, even though 
there's also Italian influences. Uh, and some of the things that are pointing that out is the courtier, um, courtier pose um, and the humanist air. So it's like very casual, not as saintly with, you know, a halo and God pointing at him like we saw earlier with the stoning of St. Stephen. Um, and it's just, it's a full-length portrait, which is also starting to be newer. Um, the first time you ever see that in Western art is in the, the portrait of a knight in um, the Tyson uh, Bordemisma Museum in Madrid. Um, and this is actually very similar to it. Uh, just, yeah, he's, he's dressed as a knight. Um, and according to the legend, um, St. Canadus was a warrior, a warrior in the Theban Legion and was martyred along with the leader of said legion, uh, the Duke, um, St. Maurice. And that was in North Egypt. Um, and basically their thing is that they wouldn't harass the local Christians because they were Christians. And they're like, no, we're not going to harass the, um, the Christians. And he supposedly died um, in 287. And it was said that he was martyred at the Swiss town of um, St. Maurice and Valais, um, at that time called Agunum, and his feast day, September 22nd. So the more you know on that one. Um, and I would just have a nice basic statuary. I really like what this museum does with sight lines in the redesign, which um, is a sight line is basically what it sounds like, where looking down straight, where you can see that the doorways kind of alternate but by standing straight, it kind of frames out the next piece of art down the way. Uh, again, they're just building around the columns where they can and um, using basic metal braces that are probably stainless steel uh, or brushed, just kind of brushed. Um, I don't think it's brushed aluminum, but there's something very low key with that artwork. Um, again, they have the upper track lighting but they still are using the cove lighting up here to bounce light up to bounce it back down and help create more of an ambient light, um, especially for uh, safety purposes. Uh, it, you can see where St. Canada's was in the old design. So if you compare that to, you know, the blue walls, it's totally different, right? Like it's a totally different feel. It's a totally different, um, you know, there's a question about LED lights, which I'll get in, back into in a moment, I swear. Um, but it can also be the exposure of the camera at which it was taken, or like, he just was really washed out here, but in the blue, he looked great, which is possible either due to the exposure or the brighter white light. Um, again, this different colored walls. They're using something other than just white. It's fantastic. And they're, you know, going up to the ceiling, maintaining the same uh, information graphics. Another really clear difference is with this Gothic um, chapel mural. And you can tell that they probably just covered these up really well rather than moving them for the read sign, because here, it's in the exact same spot. They never moved it. It's just Boop right there, build off the wall. Um, but you can see it with the tan. Um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and ask it. Okay, um, I've seen those big square doors that have probably sliding doors for fire or theft, um, but the ceilings are open. So how does that work in case of a fire? Uh, so a lot of the fire suppression systems um, are like, it, it'll, Basically, uh, so like, yes, there will be fire doors, which will help stop um, fire from going from places to places. So you have to remember that fire needs um, things to burn. So even if the um, the walls aren't to ceilings, like that's actually a really common museum because the vault, that way the vault could be basically broken down uh, for a redesign. And um, if there's not, so, so all of the, everything that the walls are made out of um, is going to be like, fire rated and fire treated before being made. And that way, um, even though they're not going to the ceiling, it is harder for the fire to get through the walls themselves. And yes, a lot of the doors are probably um, fire doors that are um, 
on magnets. So like if the alarms go off, they'll all whoop, close. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm feeling that this used to be offices based on just how low the ceiling is. And it kind of has that vibe of like, this was probably an office once um, that got <laughs> expanded in the redesign. Um, and they have these pull-out drawers, which are probably on um, mat on weights so that like, you know, you pull it out, you let it go, this goes whoop, back in for taking a closer look at some of the artwork, which is really, this is really good for light sensitive material if you don't want it to be exposed to light, light all the time. So like the things in the lower drawers probably um, are gonna be more light sensitive than the things on the top here. Cause I mean, the things on top here also have this light bar right here, illuminating them. Um, and it's the overall light in here, I'm willing to guess is lower than the light out there um, with a lot of paper materials like prints and sketches. Uh, we typically, typically, typically keep them to about five lux um, or five foot candles. So, or 50 lux, sorry, 50 lux because it's times 10 ish um, or five foot candles, which is a lot lower than um, what oil paintings and statuary can be at. Uh, we have moved here up, uh, I don't know, I hit refresh. Um, we moved here upstairs. Um, and I, again, to give a realistic representation of the museum, I feel obligated to show you some of the modern art uh, and some of the other design aspects that they did. Um, also just, I go back to the, it's a weird building. Like, look at all these weird walls, weird windows and little build outs and whatever's going on over here. It's fascinating to me. Um, and they have these backlit panels that they use a lot upstairs. Um, Dude. Uh, they got these, the same thing that they did downstairs with having all of the um, busts right in a row. They're again using pops of color to draw people inwards uh, as well as differentiate. Um, you can see that the artwork in there is more color. Uh, I'm kind of just rushing through this because I'm trying to be slightly true to a and scheme of time frame as well. You can see the light or uh, the window coverings to help bring the light levels down. Uh, the windows would also be treated with light film, uh, like film that goes on the walls as well, on the windows as well, that would help break out UV light. Um, I am utterly fascinated, or not fascinated, I know fascinated is fair, of um, getting this artwork up here. Like, I'm sure they have a freight elevator. I don't know if it fit or if they had to carry it up the stairs. These are things I think about because that's a really big piece of art and yeah. to have it framed or if they framed it on site, I have questions. <laughs> um, uh, I also like what they did here with um, in their Art Nouveau and Art Deco area. They backlit some of the artwork, which you can see in the screens over here, but then they also pointed light at the back of their uh, platforms to hide it, give it the same illuminated look. Um, yeah, here you can kind of see again just the backlight um, for some of their stain for some of the glass they have. Um, I will always send a pony. And just, you know, they're again incorporating more color into their collections rather than just having them all be pasty, whitey, beige colors. Um, this is the original ceiling. And you can zoom in some. Um, and you would think it would be in the middle of the entryway or something. It's not. It's the middle of a gallery space. I don't know why their floor plan is like that, but it is. Um, I also really like what they did here with sight lines and shadows. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot stand right here to sh and get a good sight line on how these must line up with the alcoves, but they also incorporated the shadows into the exhibition design. And it's very important when you design exhibits that you don't just plop things down, but you think about where where is it being lit from and what can we do with that? Um, they do have an outside courtyard or outside rooftop access which you currently can't get to. Um, but with it being a historic building, they just have all these little random levels. They have stairs to come on up 
as well as a little um, wheelchair, wheelchair accessible spot. Um, and I'm going through here. This is their um, pneumostatics. I, pneumostatics? I think that's how you say coin collecting. I'm really bad at that word. Pneumismatics. Um, there we go. Yeah. There, some, that, 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 that to me is like an enemy where it's like, I just, mm, that word is just hard to say. There's too many letters going on. Um, but this is actually built under the stairs of their um, like concert area, which or under the seating rather, which I thought is neat. Um, and yeah, it just you know has has lots of little coins. Um, it gives you a nice little intimate thing. I'm sure that if you're waiting to get into a concert or something, you know, it's nice to be able to look at something while you wait, um, as well as having an interactive area where I'm sure they can pull things up better. This is um, kind of what the lobby of the upstairs looks like. Um, you know, it's a big waiting area. We had gone in one direction and the other. They have some artwork out here. But again, just really weird architecture. So they're doing lots of stuff. Um, again, just to give you a comprehensive view, this is what they do for parties. It looks like a great gala. I would have, I'm sure that all of the uh, plates cost hundreds of dollars. But fancy people are going to be fancy. And so, as I mentioned, um, on their collection website, they have they can have a lot of information. Um, so this is just the apps of um, San Clement, um, which we looked at earlier. And it has, you know, you can listen to um, people talking about it. You can uh, you can go ahead and sorry, I'm going to move this. You can see you know, kind of what it looked like before they moved it out. Um, you can, they did a, you know, they kind of did a, a phasing of like what it must have looked like, you know, in its prime in the area, um, which I think is neat, which again, that's all accessible on their collection website, it tells you stuff like, you know, it has tag phrases, it has things that it's similar to. Um, here's like, you know, the cap, the inventory number, as well as um, some other logistical information. So you can look up more about it. And um, a lot of their, and their collection website is extremely robust, which I thought was neat. Um, so going, so my, my ramble about LED lighting in museums is that there are very few good options for LED lighting in museums in regards to what is well functional. Things are not as streamlined as industry wants to believe in regards to um, being able to focus lights. Like, and in Europe, they're doing better than the United States is doing in regards to this. Um, but for a very long time, people have used uh, halogen and incandescent lights. Uh, because we can like get them very focused and do really featured lighting, but it's a lot harder to do that with LEDs. A lot of that's the way that they make light because it's again the light of any diode rather than being a filament. Um, so they tend to flare. Like if you even if you put a uh, like a screen in it to like help narrow it down, um, it'll it'll cause like a flare around the edge. So it looks like you're looking at a little sun on the wall, which is not great because you know because you don't want the lighting to be distracting. You want it to be more uniform. Um, and then I was thinking of it more for lighting general areas like stairways and open spaces, mm -hmm. not for the stuff that was focused on the art. Yeah. So that is also complicated because not, not all, so again, with a lot of building infrastructure for historic buildings it's not always compatible with LEDs. And it's my favorite thing when people are like, oh yeah, this blah, 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 it's like this transformer is LED compatible. And I'm like, it's not, I just tried it. You know, um, even with like fluorescent replacement bulbs or something. Um, so that's like one of my favorite things is when people are like, oh yeah, this is dimmable. 
because a lot of those lights, uh, but even in stairways and public areas, will be dimmed um, to a certain extent because of uh, um, how things have been lit over the years. A lot of places have had built dimmers built in so that way they can be changed seasonally, as well as um, changed for events or uh, LEDs can be a lot brighter than incandescent and halogen light bulbs. So um, as technology has changed, a lot of places have dimmers built in. And even though things are like, oh, yeah, the LED compatible with the dimmer, it's like it, when you get to a certain lowness of the um, electricity going through, it'll actually cause the light to start flickering because it cannot compute, whereas a filament, will smooth, a filament bulb would smooth it out. Um, and so it's extremely complicated, and I cannot wait until the United States is on <laughs> the European level. Um, the museum I work at is the only museum in North America that has worked with the European Philips, sec the, the Philips section, the European section of the Philips company for LED lighting. And um, it has been quite the experimentation, and I wish that we could get them <laughs> over <laughs> overseas a lot easier without it being a headache. But unfortunately, US manufacturers and even the Phillips branch in the United States is not at that level. And it's like an Italian manufacturer with like German technology. And honestly, a lot of the museum technology for cases and such are, things are better made in Europe than they are in the United States and they have better options. Also, we don't fund our museums very well. No, <laughs> they're estimating that these are the, well, it, an estimation put out at the beginning of, during the middle of 2020, so towards the beginning-ish of the pandemic, is that one-third-ish, if not more, of museums in the United States will close. And whether they mean, like, little historic center museums, like community ones, or maybe some larger ones, who knows? Um, and if people follow the news, there's been a lot of debate about getting funding from deaccessioning artworks to keep the museum funded and a lot of the museum industry is run on contractors and as a lot of people know contractors tend to get screwed when businesses need um, to cut losses somewhere uh, by getting fired uh, it happened with the met it happened in dc it happened all over I, i'm very lucky that i have a federal position um, Anyway, did anyone want to see anything again or have any questions about anything? I know I can get quite rambly about museum lighting. <laughs> it's like what I do for a living or something. That was very, very interesting. I, I love your job. And I always say to my friends, I would never mind being locked up in any museum. I would spend the night there happily. Um, so I travel a lot and wherever I go, I see art and architecture and things. I was very impressed in Wittenberg, where they put a Melanchthon Museum in. Uh, the Melanchthon House is reserved as it was during Melanchthon's time. The building besides it was too rotten to be saved, so they could put a new building in it. It's connected to the Melanchthon House, and it is now a very modern museum. Uh, as I was walking through, I came through a dimly lit area, entered a very dark room, about the size of an American kitchen, so uh, this, the walls were all in glass cases and they lit up only the one little narrow section of shoulder width where I was standing in front looking at documents, handwritten um, notices from Luther, mm -hmm. text, whatever. I moved one step over, that went dark, the next light came on. That is super protective of the written materials. I was amazed with that. Yeah, the technology exists. It's just it can be hard to implement. The National Portrait Gallery has something in um, Washington D.C. has something very similar for some of their older parts of their collections as well. We're at um, the five minute mark, so you have five yeah. minutes left. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, it's amazing what technology can do for restoration and preservation nowadays that we just didn't know um, like thirty years ago. I appreciated I appreciated your class because I took some courses in museology back in the 1970s. So I know things have changed enormously <laughs> since then. There was a request to see the set of doors that was back near the beginning. I'm just kind of guessing here on a random tab. We'll find out if I would. 
um, set of. Uh, if whoever does wanted to unmute, yep, I can unmute her just a moment. Um, hello, hello. There she is. Uh, okay. Do you remember? So, um, it was one of the. It was actually when I asked my question about uh, what the medium was. I believe it was in that room. There was a set of old wooden doors directly across from the painting that you were focusing on. I'm gonna. No, nope, that was too far. Um, yeah. It's a little bit further back. I think it was back in the Roman section. Was it? Yes, back? this room. Okay, okay. Doors. I'm fairly certain it was this room. What, uh, maybe it was the room before. Wow. Um, it might have been. If the, if the question wasn't out loud asked until yeah, they're there, there they are. Sorry, try Let me see if I can get a good view on that. That's okay. This? No, the the so, door is all the way at the back oh, of the room. These doors. Yeah, those doors. Um. So, how are they? Uh, how are they like stood up? Would they be like fastened to the wall? Yeah, they're probably. Um. So let's see if I can. Oh, I can't scroll in. Oh, there we go. You can see that little bit of metal right here. Yeah. That is helping. So it'll be braced. Um, you can see it one, two, and there's probably some on the other side. And then there's probably um, wooden rock, sorry, metal across the back and then bracing into the wall. Um, and it's probably counterweighted. Uh, that being said, um, I'm going to stop sharing. I know that uh, I'm basically exactly out of time. Um, if I can figure out how to stop sharing. There, stop share. Um, anyway, thank you all. Uh, was there interest in me going back to the main room or did everyone get their questions out? Well, and there was a comment about someone who was wondering why the building and the galleries were so marvelously quirky when a visitor is looking at it, but that it might have been a nightmare to rebuild and to install the lighting and climate control. And then the exterior explained a lot of that, of how it looks. Yeah. <laughs> the World's Fair, man. It must have been a time. <laughs> this is like having something like that every year. Yeah. Yeah. You do also mm -hmm. have um, an overflow room if you want to continue your discussion. Yeah. It's a Toledo overflow. Huh? Well, let's see if I can pick that. I'm going to go Are ahead you? and stop the recording now yep. since there are two minutes left. But thank you yep. so very much for the tour. Great. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thank you.